Some call it a moral imperative. Some, some say it's that high of a, of a priority. Um, I would agree that it is a priority for us to do. The environment uh, is a treaty right. The habitat is a treaty right. To, to, and uh, even though today habitat's still being destroyed faster and it's being repaired, this will hopefully get us to the point eventually that we turn that corner. We built the culverts, we blocked the streams, and now we have a, a mandate, but it's also the right thing to do. If we don't take these actions, we stand to lose one of the greatest resources we have in our state. In 2013, a federal injunction required the rapid correction of state-owned culverts to allow fish passage and open up a thousand miles of upstream habitat for fish in the state. One of those is located here at Chico Creek in Silverdale. In this episode of Field Report, we explore how the state transportation budget helps make that happen. For centuries, the fish and seafood industry has carved a significant imprint in Washington state's culture and trade. The state's geography, natural resources, and tribal heritage are all pivotal elements contributing to the economic development of the Pacific Northwest. Thanks to Washington's waters that provide a suitable habitat for salmon, trout, and other fish species native to this side of the coast. But for decades, those natural habitats have been compromised by man-made barriers, also known as culverts, that block the natural passage of fish, impeding their ability to spawn, migrate, and survive in the ocean. But first, in order to understand how certain culverts become barriers to fish, it's crucial to consider that decades ago, when the state built roads and highways, they weren't quite equipped with the science that's available today. And to accommodate the intersection of road over the natural flow of water, culverts were built under them. When we built the state highway system, are the roads cross streams in many, many locations. Kim Mueller heads the Fish Barrier Removal Program for the state's Department of Transportation, or WashDOT. The idea at that time was that we needed to efficiently just get water from one side of the road to the other. We weren't really, um, we didn't have the science, we weren't really considering what that was doing to the fish that need to pass through under our highways in those streams. She says WashDOT is committed to addressing this, and while doing so, also meeting the terms of the federal injunction. In the 1990s, we really started to focus on correcting those fish barriers, so we have a history of doing this type of work. Culverts that cause high water velocity essentially create a water flow that's too fast for fish to swim through. Culverts that create shallow water depth, on the other hand, create a barrier with not enough water for fish to pass. The idea behind corrected culverts is to remove concrete barriers and recreate natural stream conditions, creating a much more suitable habitat for salmon and other fish species, so they can complete their life cycle, grow their young enough to survive in the ocean, and hopefully return to lay eggs for years to come. And we also look at culvert condition. So if it's a structurally failing culvert, then that will bump it up in priority because we, it has to be corrected anyway. We have about 1,000 barriers that are subject to the injunction, and we have about 400 barriers that we need to fix by the year 2030. For over half a century, water passing through the creek has been curtailed by two eight-foot concrete culverts. Marine biologists call it a choke point, suggesting that removing the remaining barriers of the creek, seen here, is the last remaining effort to allow the creek to breathe and live out its full potential. The state has invested millions of dollars throughout the years in restoring portions of it and is currently under pressure to correct hundreds of others across the state by 2030 to meet the requirements of the federal injunction. I witnessed them building that when I was a little kid. I didn't realize they were destroying the creek. 
Rob Purser, a tribal elder from the Suquamish tribe, has grown up around Chico Creek. This particular culvert area, where this culvert is, Chico Creek, it's a uh, historic village site. Chief Chico was uh, in that area, Chief Kitsap too. He says the culverts dramatically decreased salmon population in the Kitsap Peninsula. Today, we still fish salmon, but not like we used to because uh, uh, they're just hardly any salmon left in a lot of areas. For years, the tribes have maintained their stance in holding the state accountable for correcting culverts under state roads. The court ruling was considered a big win for the 21 tribes that collectively fought to make that happen. The Squamish tribe very much wants to see the, the barriers replaced and, and fixed for future generations because it'll benefit the salmon. Purser says salmon is the cornerstone of their tribal food chain and obstructing their natural passage largely affects their tribal harvest. The abundance of salmon in the creek was huge and to the point every year it's the creek smelled. I mean that November that whole area smelled and today you don't get too much of that. We very seldom have a directed fishery in that area anymore because of the lack of fish. And the stark evidence lies in the dwindling amount of fish escapement. The creek itself needs a minimum of 20,000. That's kind of our escapement goal. Tom Ostrom is a biologist for the Suquamish tribe. He designs projects to restore fish passage. Uh, a, lot, a lot of times what happens, especially with, um, with chum salmon, they're not, they're not real good um, jumpers and they don't do well with, um, with these, these uh, high velocities that come through these small culverts. Um, they'll struggle to, to get through the pipe and oftentimes they'll just um, they'll get stranded out of exhaustion and then they just perish because they can't, they can't make it up to the spawning grounds. He says that over time, the channel below the Chico Creek culverts degraded. Ostrom explains how the barriers affect their spawning and cause an ecological imbalance for a wider fraction of other species, such as the southern resident killer whale. The whales will follow uh, the chum salmon into Dye's Inlet and they'll stay for weeks um, just feeding on, on the chum salmon there. So, um, you know, they're, they're also um, supporting uh, other ecosystem um, components and values that, that um, that we as a region um, really value. The previous barriers in Chico Creek have already been addressed by the county years ago. It's now up to the state to remove the last two. WashDOT engineer Lona Moody heads that project. There's five fish barriers that we'll be removing. Uh, we'll be replacing those with two new bridges, one 200-foot uh, clear span bridge on SR3 spanning over Chico Creek and a smaller bridge spanning over the unnamed tributary on Chico Way. Th this is a pretty big project and it's going to take us a couple years to complete, so we are, we're going to have to work year-round. So when we are done with the project, there'll just be two crossings and they'll be completely open for free-flowing streams. While correcting fish culverts is seen as an unavoidable priority, given the injunction, tribes call it a treaty right. While state legislators say it's a moral obligation. These barriers that were put in were not put in um, to uh, intentionally destroy that. It's part of our, it's part of our heritage, it's part of our culture. Um, going back to, uh, you know, from the beginning. Uh, our Native American, you know, the tribes, and how important and sacred salmon is, and how that's been so important to culture and through art, to, through to Washingtonians. They did file the lawsuit um, because there had been, for a long period of time, no action to resolve the problem. And obviously, they were here first, um, and they have a particular sense of responsibility themselves um, to nature and the animals that are here, including the fish. The House Transportation Committee, along with the Senate, is tasked with allocating a budget to cover culvert corrections, including those at Chico Creek, which comes at a price tag of almost $58 million. And committee leaders say it was not an easy task. We had very little money for fish culvert uh, restoration in the previous package uh, in 2015. So I did, it did create a sense of urgency, uh, and I think it's a good thing that it created a sense of urgency. Um, a little bit more time might have been better, but um, 
we need to get the work done. Unfortunately, we had some federal dollars come in that we were able to move some things around uh, to be able to maintain that, and we funded it at one of the highest levels in this last budget cycle um, than we've done to date. But the cost for Chico Creek is only a fraction of how much it would take to remove all state-owned culverts. The fish barrier removal is a big undertaking. This is about a five to six billion dollar ten-year project um, dealing with what's called the injunction area, which is primarily in the Puget Sound region uh, of these barriers, but then you also have all the ancillary barriers, uh, counties and local governments and everything else um, that come into play. There are more fish culverts under the ownership of city and county government and private parties than the state um, has created. So it's a bigger problem than just, than just the state of Washington. To successfully meet the terms of the injunction, the state would need $3.7 billion, a hefty figure to date, especially since it hasn't fully recovered from the COVID pandemic. This is a very challenging investment time period to do all this work, over $3 billion worth of work in 10 years. These things are always fluid, they're always in, in motion. So um, we are relying on them to give us the most accurate data, accurate amounts that we need to budget for because again, we don't have this great flexibility to be able to come up with another $100 million because we're short. And we had to make some tough decisions and especially with COVID, um, you know, our budget took a, about an $800 million hit we had to take it from uh, future highway projects um, unless there is a influx of new money. We have, we have a time frame to live with and um, the, the funding was available, um, but it, it delays, it at least delays some road construction projects. So ordered. During the 2021 legislative session, state lawmakers unanimously greenlit a transportation budget that allocates $400 million in federal stimulus money to fish barrier corrections. But Representative Barkas says we can't always rely on federal aid. Anytime the federal money comes in, there's strings attached. And so we have to navigate what we can and cannot do. So we have to budget as if we don't have that federal money and then we backfill and we kind of look at it. So we budgeted this with the assumption that the federal money will cover what we can do. And according to Representative Fai, rearranging funds to cover culvert projects within the injunctions deadline doesn't come without consequences. Unlike the federal government, we have to have a balanced budget. We can't spend more money than we have. At some point, it'll catch up with us, right? So we'll need, um, as we do the next transportation package, to replace that most of that $3 billion. Mueller explains how legislative funding has helped the agency meet the 2013 court mandate. So over two years, we, we tripled the program because the legislature you know, fully funded what we requested in the past two years. And we're tripling the program again this biennium. So we are in that process of ramping up the program considerably. And it is because of the legislature um, funding last two years and then these next two years fully funding the program. She also shares how far that effort has gone. So from 2013 to 2019, we corrected 66 barriers. Then in 2020, we corrected 14 barriers, which improved access to 55 miles of fish habitat upstream. We also have 54 barrier corrections that are currently in construction, but that's 54 more barriers. And we've got 80 barriers that are currently in design. And looking at a nine-year deadline ahead, tribes are hopeful that their joint effort with agencies and legislators would yield ecological benefits not only for them, but for the rest of the state. It's a step in the right direction. It's not a fix-all. We know that, but it's a big step to recover salmon. We're hoping that uh, will happen without having to go back to court to try to speed things up. Moving forward, state lawmakers in Washtot say they will continue to work together to address culverts and preserve the state's economy and aquatic resource, regardless of the federal injunction. It doesn't stop at 2030. Um, we are going to be doing this work for a long time in the future. And unless we get more resources, um, we'll continue to be in that. But the culverts will get funded. There is no economy without a good transportation system, period. If you can't move goods and services and people and uh, it, 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 we've seen the impacts of that. So it's, it's very important that we continue to work together.
for Field Report. This is Angela Nolasco.